Group exhibitions include Monica Reyes Gallery, Vancouver, Kamloops Art Gallery, and Art Toronto with Cooper Cole. In 2021, she was commissioned to create an artwork for the second installment of the Boren Banner Series, a public art in in initiative at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle. Her work is part of several collections, including the O'Dayan Art Museum, Vancouver Art Gallery, and the Surrey Art Gallery. CORE gratefully acknowledges the support of the Canada Council for the Arts. Emmy Sparks is an artist and educator currently living in Winnipeg Treaty 1 territory. She holds an MFA from Emily Carr University of Art and Design and a BFA from NASCAD University. Recent exhibitions include Trap Projects, OO Gallery, Duncan, BC. Her work has been shown at Access Gallery Vancouver, Frank Gallery Vancouver, Dynamo Arts Association, 5050 Arts Collective Victoria, Support London, Ontario, and Site Factory Vancouver. Upcoming projects include a solo exhibition at the Alternator Centre for Con Contemporary Art in Kelowna, BC. Andrea Taylor holds an MFA in visual art from Vermont College of Fine Arts, Montpellier, 2014. She's had solo shows at the Back Gallery Project and Malaspina Printmakers in Vancouver. Taylor holds, uh, Taylor completed a spring intensive residency at BAMP Center, Alberta in 2017 and has held two collaborative drawing residencies with Marjorie Theroux. Her sculptures will be part of a group exhibition curated by Mohamed Salami at Richmond Art Gallery in 2022. Uh, she has taught for many years at Emily Carr University Continuing Studies Program and is represented by Monica Reyes Gallery in Vancouver. And I'd also like to introduce the writers um, who contributed generous and thoughtful texts to the exhibition publication, which took the form of a zine. So it was a very collaborative process creating this uh, publication. Some of you may have picked it up when you were at the gallery. It looks like this. It's um, kind of, you know, made, it's, it's kind of Xerox style uh, zine, but it has some really beautiful uh, critical and uh, essays about the artists in the exhibition and also uh, images of the artist's work and sort of more um, meanderings and writings that because each artist has their own writing practice. So it was a very beautiful collaborative process making this zine. So uh, Yanni Kong and Jane Wilkinson both contributed essays to the zine. Uh, Yanni Kong is Shirk Doctoral Fellow of Contemporary Art at the School for Contemporary Arts at Simon Fraser University. Kong's research area is in reception aesthetics and contemporary art history and is a member of the Low Carbon Research Methods Working Group. She explores sustainable practices in streaming media in online teaching and learning. Kong is a faculty member in the Department of Art History and Religious Studies at Langara College, Vancouver, and an editor and critic for several Canadian publications. Jane Wilkinson is a writer, editor, and curator. She's former editor-in-chief at Canadian Art and regularly contributes to art publications, including Art Agenda, Art Forum, C Magazine, Momus, Essie, and others. She holds an MA in Art History and Critical Theory from the University of British Columbia and has organized exhibitions and public programs for galleries and artist-run centers across Canada. She is ses sessional lecturer in visual studies at the University of Toronto and in art history at McMaster University, Hamilton, Ontario. So uh, this talk will be kind of taking the form of a panel. So I prepared questions, the writers have prepared questions, and it'll be um, conversational and organic uh, conversation. Um, so just to sort of take it away, I have a very uh, initial sort of uh, warm up question here for the artists. Tell us where you're coming from today, where you're at, and give us a brief introduction to your work in the exhibition, we can only hint at this with words, the Gordon Smith Gallery of Canadian Art. So which artist would like to start? I'm gonna start, Resna? Good start, yeah, oh, thank sure. you. I had to make sure I was unmuted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hi everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, I am joining this call from Richmond, BC in my studio, my home base studio. And uh, for me in the show, I was really interested in kind of digging into surface. And I know that's kind of sounds broad, but I'm very interested in surface and different surfaces and how that can affect the marks that are being made and how the work is just is read in general. So uh, for the show, I was interested in um, kind of digging deeper into this kind of side practice that I've had of photography and printmaking and kind of exploring the similarities and differences between how all surfaces are treated be, uh, between painting, photography, 
uh, specifically film photography and lino cut printmaking. And in a lot of ways, the surfaces are treated uh, similarly, in my opinion, with uh, being rotated, being inverted, being cut out of, being added onto. Uh, so just as an intro, that was where I was coming from uh, for the show in particular, or for the work that I showed in the exhibition. Uh, I can I can jump in next. Um, so I'm Emmy, and I'm joining from Winnipeg uh, right now. I I lived in Vancouver for many years, and recently relocated to to Winnipeg uh, Treaty One territory. Um, yeah, so I'm the work in this show is definitely coming from a kind of long ongoing exploration of, of my practice as a painter and kind of how I have been thinking about how painted images can kind of resist language, which Kate was kind of already talking about in the introduction to the show, but resist language through methods of abstraction and um, ways we respond to images and specifically the ways we kind of seek to classify and, and define and, and know uh, what we are looking at. And, and I'm kind of interested in a resistance to that. So um, I'm also in this work in the show kind of thinking about how social narrative and behavior is kind of written through, through a history of images. And I'm pulling quite specifically from painting history, um, kind of quoting and, and, and mashing up um, uh, historical references as a, as a kind of questioning of how do we maybe rewrite, is it possible to kind of rewrite certain narratives or at least look at them um, uh, at a, through a new angle? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the last point I'll say about the work in this show too, before we get into deeper questions, um, I'm kind of, while I'm quoting from history, I'm kind of interested in how those shapes uh, become new, autonomous, and kind of freed from what is often kind of a problematic, fraught, or even violent kind of corner of history that I may be pulling from. Um, so the shapes become their own new thing in this show. And again, it kind of goes back to that idea of how language can be tied to an image, um, or maybe an image becomes untethered from, from that need for language. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming at for the work in this show. Thanks. Thanks, Emmy. I'm Andrea, and I'm coming to you from Burnaby, um, from my home in Burnaby. And uh, it's part of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam Nations unceded territory. Um, and for my work in the show, uh, I had 24 sculptures there. They're all um, at the same time, abstract, they're also hinting at anthropomorphic and biomorphic forms. Um, they're mixed media, mostly cardboard, uh, quite playful, yet serious and strong, um, and kind of hoping to invite the viewer into a conversation with them, this wordless conversation that we're talking about. Um, those same kind of anthropomorphic or biomorphic forms are in the stop motion video, which was also in the exhibition. Um, and for that video, it's four minutes and it has um, three figures interacting. They're made of uh, charcoal. So I'm adding and subtracting, erasing and adding charcoal. Um, and the figures are interacting and they disappear and reform in plasticine and disappear and reform in charcoal and the video is on a loop. So um, there's a lot of interest in my practice in embodied responses uh, to visual art. And so the stop motion video seemed to really uh, get at that a bit directly as well as the sculpture, just being a, um, another body in the room kind of thing for the viewer's body to react with. So I was interested in the exhibition and, and also having this conversation between all three of us uh, and the three of our, our works. Um, that was important to me uh, in the exhibition as well. Thanks, Andrea. Um, should we launch into a first question from Yanni? 
Sure. Hi, everyone. And I just wanted to say thank you to the artists and to Kate and to Meredith at the Smith Foundation for including me and my writing um, in this really exciting, wonderful exhibition that we've all been part of. Um, I, I'm going to reformulate my first question. I know we kind of talked about it a little bit, just in light of, because you all touched a little bit on your process. Um, and I also want to open this question up to Kate as a curator. Um, because I'm really interested in the aim of this show, which is based around the idea of gathering works around extraverbal language and what these processes reveal. Um, and as artists and as writers, there's always this idea that, um, because we're, I think something that unites all of us is uh, this idea of being very interested in potentiality or trying to uncover something um, that might not be very easily expressible, um, you know, through different through different tactics. But because both art and writing um, always veer towards the description, there is this idea that we might get there. So I guess I'm really curious to hear from you all about. I guess like if it's possible or can we at all describe this thing we're trying to access um, and it could be a thing or it could be an affect, it could be some kind of quality or some piece of vitality, but what is this thing that we are trying to access and uh, how are we trying to access? And I am understanding that that could be very different for all of us. It's a great question, Yanni. Thank you. Maybe one of the artists could start that off and we can circle back curatorially. <laughs> yeah, I can I can jump in. So um so yeah, I also have your question written out as well, Yanni. So, <laughs> um so from yeah, I, I'm interested in that idea of what what can we access, what what are we trying to access up, uh, in that place beyond beyond words, beyond language. Um and um, in my own practice, actually for, for a long time, I've, I've been thinking about um, uh, not necessarily abstraction, but just how does, a, how, how can an image kind of hover at the edge of recognition and um, kind of beyond any binary kind of thinking of abstraction representation, but more so like a, a very kind of um, embodied, embodied experience of the viewer of, of can you recognize or not what is familiar and, and what kind of falls into a place of unknowing or not knowing and Kate used the word um, vulnerability at the start um, when speaking about this idea of not being able to name what we see and I'm really interested in actually tapping into that in my work of um, I used to try to get at it get at that when again I'm, I'm like circling around what that is but um, by playing with really dark color palettes, for example, in my paintings, trying to kind of get this embodied experience of when you wake up in a dark room and your eyes have to adjust and you're kind of trying to navigate through this dark space and the world becomes very unfamiliar suddenly, like sh shapes become different things than, than what they were when the lights were on. Um, so, so for a time I was trying to get at that experience of kind of vulnerability of, of, of not knowing of a kind of, of a new world starting to take shape um, when you just kind of can't see, can't um, kind of process uh, with language exactly what you're looking at. Um, but I've, I think in this work in the show, I'm also trying to kind of get at that through um, actual kind of obfuscation or like occlusion, the, the layered cutouts. Uh, I, I have kind of painted canvas cutouts um, or draped over stands and they're literally kind of blocking and hiding what's beneath them. Um, so there's this idea that there is something more but we just don't quite have access to it. Um, and I'm interested in kind of how we, how we navigate the, the, the tension of, of that maybe. Um, Anyway, so so I think that keyword of vulnerability is is maybe what I'm thinking about when I'm when I'm asking what am I trying to get to beyond language of vulnerability of actually not of being um, quite uncomfortable when you can't uh, 
classify, categorize um, when something doesn't fit in a, in a kind of binary definition. Um, you know, I'm curious uh, if the other artists are tapping into something similar or different. Yeah, I, I think um, the idea of abstraction actually uh, allows you to enter that extraverbal conversation a little bit easier because um, you're outside of words. The viewer is more easily outside of words. Um, and I have this idea that I like, it's kind of out there, but I, I like thinking about uh, an extraverbal experience with visual art as an opportunity for leaps of thought. It's almost like because you're not using words in your brain that you can experience a, a leap in thought or feeling. Um, and for me, I, I go back to when I was a kid at Bowen Island, uh, a little island near here. Um, and I would sit next to the ocean and I was doing what I know now I was meditating, but at the time I didn't know what that was. Um, I was right next to the water and the waves are coming towards me and I just felt heavy in my body. And um, that sort of feeling is what I think an embodied response is because you're having that with a large body of water that's quite common to feel. Uh, and it's an extra verbal kind of conversation that you're having. Um, so that's kind of what I'm after in my work. I think about that a lot, that experience. And um, I put that into my work in the hopes that it will kind of be in there somehow and allow a viewer to have that experience. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, and I guess, Emmy, you had said something, um, you mentioned like unsaid words. And I think from my own personal experiences um, and just my upbringing, there was so much, I feel like that was unsaid and um, not to be questioned and just to kind of accept. And so I feel like, you know, I'm originally from Brampton, Ontario. So I kind of go back and forth between uh, Richmond and Brampton. And I feel like every time I'm back home and I have you know, time to talk to my grandmother and my mom and my aunts, and I feel like every conversation more and more is uncovered. And so for me, it's almost like all of those years of things just not being said or not being talked about had really bothered me. And I want answers from people that have influenced my life in such a way. And so I feel like every time I'm back home, I'm like on a mission to kind of peel back another layer of someone who's really close to me and who has quite literally influenced the way that I approach my materials and my practice. And sometimes those answers aren't very direct. They're kind of like a roundabout way of saying things or uh, avoiding certain topics. And But when you actually can finally get the answers or have those conversations with people that are close to you, you realize, you know, it's almost all of those kind of roundabout ways of saying things or avoiding certain things, it's all a way to protect themselves and to maybe not reveal something that has caused them pain in the past and they just kind of want to forget it or sweep it under the rug. Um, which in my own personal experience within like, you know, my Punjabi community is very prevalent. And so within my work, I feel like certain times, especially the work in the show here, I felt like I was making myself a lot more vulnerable with showing some photography and printmaking, which some of the imagery involved was a lot more direct than what I'm used to using. And I, I'm used to painting and kind of, um, you know, using tools like abstraction to maybe also uh, not have uh, such a direct way of communicating. And in some ways I feel like the way I treat my surfaces with you know swapping them you know in and out or turning them upside down and it's almost like when it, when I feel like something is too direct I'm trying to purposely throw that off and um, maybe in in the use of color or even scale trying to deflect or distract from you know what is in the work that I feel like is is kind of private and I'm trying to get better at that. Um, but I do think it stems from this kind of lifelong, um, you know, not really being super direct and not really saying exactly how you feel because you don't know how it's gonna be received. And 
typically, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's changed, things are changed a lot now, but it's not always encouraged just to kind of speak your mind. And so for me, the role of text in my work has actually become quite important too. And um, I know like Andrea has a, a, a poetry uh, practice or a writing practice and same with Emmy. And I feel like uh, writing has also been very complicated because I kind of grew up with it having to be very structured and direct, which didn't necessarily work with the way that my mind thinks. Um, and then, you know, more recently I've kind of like my surfaces and like the materials that I used have started to rearrange the text to become a little bit more abstracted and a little bit more maybe open-ended um, and including text in my work, including text in the titles of my work. Um, but I, say, I think overall, I feel like I'm kind of doing exactly what is bothering me about, you know, uncovering all these things. I'm kind of also um, making work in a, in a way that isn't very direct or isn't um, maybe very easy to read and kind of purposely complicating the surface or purposely complicating text or using text more as a way of mark making versus uh, like a direct form of communication. Mm. Can I just, can I kind of respond to that really quickly? Um, it's it's interesting, Rasna, to hear you. I haven't actually heard you kind of talk that in depth in about that specific topic of when something becomes kind of too easy, you try to like retreat back and make it bring a different kind of difficulty to it. And I find, I just, I feel like that's a point a lot of painters right now, artists right now are, are thinking about and, and, and this kind of like role of the work of, is it meant like, is the work meant to communicate? And does it have kind of an obligation to, to communicate something clearly and directly or not? And, and for me, I think that I do the same thing where I'm actually like looking to kind of, uh, again, I use the word like obfuscate or kind of complicate that communication. And I, for me, it comes from a desire to um, resist like the immediacy of, of the image world we are in, of everything being so accessible, so easy, so at our fingertips that we are going, you know, 100 miles an hour through Instagram looking at images. So for me, that kind of um, resistance to clear communication comes from like a, a desire to just like get someone to do a double take, look again, slow down, try to read this when it's not so legible because we have such a desire for just instantaneous communication right now. Mm. So anyway, just kind of made me think of that. I just want to like respond to just this thing that you both have said, um, because both of you talk about the process of complication uh, within your work. And the root word of complication is like something like complicare, which means to fold together. Mm -hmm. um, and something that you have both sort of pointed to is, uh, is particularly you, Emmy, with your uh, cutout uh, pieces is actually there seems to be more of a strategy of enclosure, which like the emphasis that I, I think my question places is more on this uncovering, but it sounds more like your process refers more uniquely to keeping some things enfolded mm -hmm. rather than to unfold. And I actually think that that is a uh, really unique quality because it speaks to the fact that some things are so precious that we keep them to ourselves for certain for whatever certain reasons. Even Andrea's really special story about sitting with the ocean and that really personal conversation that she had, in a way, uh, can only be known by Andrea, um, and so that might be something really special that you might keep protected to enfold rather than to unfold, which mm -hmm. I don't know, seems, seems like a really cool thing <laughs> and almost uh, beyond, beyond the scope of what we're trying to do, which is to make things more legible or make access something that isn't immediately there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was really challenging, like curatorially for me, because I'm trying to put 
the exhibition and these ideas into words because that's my job so like to sit down and have to like okay how am I going to write about this show because it really is about experience and about a body embodied experience and for me it was a real challenge because my comfort level is in photography that's my training that's my that's what I write about that's you know I also you know, I'm not as as much of a practicing artist as I was but I you know primarily that's my work was in lens-based media and photography and so to be like, okay, I have to write about painting and sculpture. Again, that feeling of vulnerability. And I think it was a good lesson for me to really experience a work and not just like go to, you know, for me when I'm like writing about photography is like going to the theory, going back to the theory. Instead, think about how do I feel in the room with this artwork? Like, how does it make me feel? And honestly, that was a really uncomfortable experience for me because I was trained to go to the books and think and like, you know, really theorize something. And so to, to think about it, critically but also experientially was um it was it was a real interesting challenge and um so yeah I just wanted to bring that up in terms of vulnerability and in terms of trying to put something into words uh that is very hard to put into words and so you know to really experience each artist's work you know Emmy was in, was in Winnipeg so I had to experience it via zoom which is challenging I mean I have seen your work in person before but some of your newer pieces I hadn't really seen but then you know to go to Russell's studio and Andrea's studio and really experience and take in the work I mean that that's important regardless but in this case it felt like it was needed you know to really be able to write about it so yeah um Jane did you want to hop in with your first question yeah, sure. Um, and also just to say quickly, uh, thanks, Kate and Meredith and um, Rustin and Emmy and Andrea for the invitation to sort of participate um, and engage with your work in this way. And maybe I'm just going to kind of pick up a little bit this kind of question um, around recognizability and legibility um, and sort of how each of you and your works make things both kind of appear and and recede or appear and disappear. Um, and yeah, one of the things I was really interested in is this process of like material transformation. So like working with a kind of material or even like working with um, paint or sort of like the materials of an artistic practice um, and just kind of how you each sort of tread this line between abstraction and representation. Um, and so I guess I, my question is sort of like, it'd be great to hear from each of you maybe a little bit more specifically about like what those materials are and kind of how you know when um sort of like how you know when you're finished or how you know when it comes to the point that the materials have transformed enough to become not just their individual matter but the kind of overall assemblage or sort of the overall composition and I guess Rosna, I was thinking with maybe yours in particular because of you working in the gallery but I think also I mean Andrea you both are putting things very disparate kinds of materials in dialogue with each other. And yeah, maybe if you could each just speak a little bit more specifically to the sorts of materials you use and how you know when that process is finished. <laughs> Who wants to start with that one? It's a tricky one. Sorry, I was, <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to, um, if if someone else wants to go, because I, I might actually share my screen to oh, yes. um, oh, yeah. show some additional images, but I've just got yeah. to pull that file. If up. at any point you'd like to share images, I go for it. I think I might have to give you permission to do that, but. Sure. Uh, so I have it ready to go. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is a tricky question, like knowing when, when something is complete or when, but I don't even know. I don't even know if you can, if you can necessarily accomplish everything in, you know, one painting. And I try to give myself that flexibility or, or you know, um, that sense of mm. if I have an idea that's started, it doesn't need to necessarily be completed in this painting. This could lead to the next. And in that sense, I think of my work is like this very iterative, iterative process where one painting builds upon the next. And I think the idea is to eventually be able to get to a place where uh, the painting is what I have going on in my mind, which is very complex. But um, uh, I, I do have some process images of uh, one of the works in the show, the, the one of my largest paintings in the show. And I'll just share my screen. Um, so that I can show that. Are you able to do that, Rasna? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, so hold on. Can you mm -hmm. try it now? 
Yep, there we go, Great. got it. Okay, so um, this piece here, oops, is um, called Neat and Tidy Echoing Again and Again. Um, and there's lots of different materials that I've used in this work. Uh, the work is about 16 by nine feet uh, large and it's composed of about 15 different panels that have come together kind of like a puzzle to create this larger composition. And I actually started off with this panel here, which is like a 48 by 48 size panel. And it was previously a part of another work where I had uh, different intentions for it. And then just wasn't quite doing what I wanted it to do. So I set it aside in my studio for quite some time. And then when the possibilities of the show came up, I kind of pulled that back out and started to kind of build my composition with adding surfaces around it. And I flipped the this panel upside down to kind of in, in an attempt to detach myself from some of my original ideas for the work. And um, and so this is the piece in its earlier stage. Uh, so a lot of, I mean, I, I pull from a lot of different uh, sources of inspiration and I've done lots of different things in my life before I arrived to painting. Um, things like uh, my kind of early beginnings in uh, uh, at the University of Waterloo when I was studying biology and then moving towards uh, working with my mom very closely uh, with uh, some Indian fashion design and kind of growing up in the Indian wedding industry. All of my mom's sisters kind of dabbled in various aspects of the Indian wedding, which is a very over the top, overwhelming experience. And then I also moved to uh, designing my own uh, surfaces. So I would uh, mm. design kind of commercial textiles and other surface patterns that could be placed on a variety of objects. And then I kind of arrived to painting. So I feel like in a lot of ways, when I'm working on a painting, I'm pulling from various aspects of all of these life experiences. And then also, you know, kind of my own personal upbringing and uh, bringing that to painting. And so for me, painting on one surface sometimes is very much a challenge because it feels like it's I'm creating this very, to a certain degree, this very fixed kind of thing that, you know, doesn't really necessarily have the possibility to grow or shrink. Whereas when I'm working with multiple panels, um, each of those panels can be rotated a number of times, it can be swapped out. Uh, the panels are of varying depths, uh, varying materials. So I use canvas, but I also use wood panel. And sometimes I use other stretched fabrics and textiles. And, um, and then in terms of the actual materials that I'm using, I mainly use acrylic paint, but I also use oil stick and spray paint. And I mix things into my acrylic paint to give it some body and volume so that it doesn't dry so flat. So in this piece, I've also used sawdust. Um, and I, I think I have some close-up shots here. So I also use different methods to apply my paint to the surface. So I use palette knives, brushes, but I also kind of create these makeshift piping bags where I kind of squeeze the paint out onto my surface. And uh, much of the time I'm sketching digitally. So when I'm actually arriving or when I'm actually painting on my surfaces, I'm trying my best to get as far away from that very flat, um, you know, digital image. So I. I try my best to create all of these textures that I also, you know, gravitate towards because, you know, my own kind of personal reasons. Um, and so I actually didn't see the piece installed uh, altogether until I was in the space, um, which was kind of daunting, but it, it, you know, some of the panels, they don't quite line up or, um, you know, there they may, may be slight gaps between the panels, which I've also kind of started to embrace as a part of the process and mm. um, you know wanting to get away from creating these kind of perfect surfaces and perfection was something that I was very obsessed with growing up and I was striving for, for perfection and you know I would get very hard on myself when things didn't go the way that they were planned and painting has taught me a lot and one of the things is like giving up some of that control mm. and um, and you know gallery walls aren't perfect the panels aren't perfect um, you know, it's just kind of, uh, I think, a, a big lesson in, in giving up control and allowing the materials to do what the materials are going to do. 
And so that was my last image for that work there. That's great. Thank Sorry, you. For I can that. go more in depth, but I'm also very aware that there, you know, Emmy and Andrea have lots to say about their work as well. No, it's good to put some images up for everyone to mm -hmm. see. Thank you. Who would like to go next? And let me know if you want me to um, open up that presentation if you want to see any images from the show, if you're talking particularly about that. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I wouldn't mind uh, sharing my screen as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think you should be able to. Can I? Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess when I'm working with the cardboard, um, the cardboard has a say and I have a say in how the, the shape is gonna form. Mm. Um, it's, it's not all me, I think, because there's a conversation going on. And um, yeah, I think I really, to find out when, when they're finished, um, it's, it's a point at which they feel like they're their own entity. It's hard to describe. It's like a, as if, even though they haven't been, it's like it's always been this way. This is, this is itself. Uh, it, they're sort of um, almost like someone's juggling and they've got a perfect whole bunch of plates in the air and everything's in perfect balance. Uh, so it's a matter of, of wrestling with the, the cardboard at first. And then um, over time, over several months, they slowly start to show their personality, if you will. And uh, they take on almost a life of their own. Um, I know when they're not finished, <laughs> <laughs> that I can say. Uh, and I, I often like I'll sit in my studio and I, I eat my lunch and I, while I'm doing that, I'm looking at the sculptures, I have them all out and I'm, I'm looking at them and thinking about what do they want? What does each one want right now? And I'll stand with them and turn them around and, and spend lot, a lot of time over weeks and months looking at them and slowly respond to them in various ways. So um, yeah, it's kind of a process. And, and when they're done, uh, yeah, as I say, they're their own entity, their own being, kind of. Um, so I guess that's my, oh, that was a stop motion one. Uh, they definitely feel like that. Like they definitely have their own character or their own, you get a sense that they do each have these very individual personalities. Oh, that's great, yeah. Yeah, they, they feel like that to me. Uh, people, I, ha I have a work up in a show right now, the same work from the Gordon Smith Gallery show, just half of it in, in a, a gallery, Monica Reyes Gallery in Vancouver. And uh, the opening was last night and people, I was asked at least three times this question. I was really surprised by it. People were asking me, which one is your favorite? Mm. <laughs> oh, well, that's really hard to say because I, I really feel connected to each one of them and you know in their formation to become these little as you say these little characters or have have their own character um so that was a question i couldn't answer <laughs> i also yeah. have a question andrea because i was so yeah. curious about it and i don't know if we got a chance to talk about it but those kind of found objects that are mm -hmm. a part of the cardboard sculptures and mm -hmm. it's almost like especially seeing them in a large group at the at the gordon smith gallery um you know it's it's kind of like you have this this one viewpoint where, you know, you have an understanding that, okay, there's cardboard being used and there's, you know, other finishings that have been applied to the surface. But then once you turn the corner and then you see this kind of object that it, it's, it's almost like a jarring experience, you know, there'll be like a faucet, like a tap or like a faucet kind of gear thing. I don't know all the, the names of the parts, but it's like, it, it adds this like element of surprise, but um, maybe you can expand upon those found uh, materials within the work. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that that also brings up for me the 
the idea um, that I like to play with that when you're approaching the sculpture, you can't actually tell right away what the materials mm -hmm. are, but that you can if you look a bit longer. So you will see that it's cardboard if you look for a bit, but you don't see that right away. And I really like that um, mm -hmm. uh, engaging the, the viewer in, in this um, experience, because that's what the work is about, this experience of, of being with that object and having that uh, embodied response or that extra verbal conversation, whatever's going on. So I think those little metal pieces, um, they're partly me playing with materials like the, I like the cardboard because of its vulnerability and leaving it so that you can actually tell that's what it is. Um, I feel like the vulnerability of that material or of the, the metal, scrap metal, it's been thrown away. Um, that it speaks uh, to the vulnerability in ourselves. So it's almost like uh, engaging the viewer in, in this mirrored conversation, like I, I am this sculpture in a way. I see myself, I feel myself um, reflected in it, in that vulnerability of the material. But the material really retreats into the object, I find. Like mm -hmm. you look at them, especially when they're together, you look at them and they, uh, they aren't, they aren't the sum of their parts anymore. Right. Uh, there and uh, even the way that the viewer has to wrestle with that tension, um, almost not to anthropomorphize, not to call it a guy, not to ask you which one is your favorite, as you might ask your mother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it. It really asks you to resist that. And um, when I, when I attended the show and I was watching your film again. Um, my friend said to me, it's so funny because uh, you want to you wanna see it as a body, but really it is just form. It's just form as it constantly is changing. So there is like this interesting kind of like tension that you have to wrestle with as a viewer. And it almost seems like you kind of have to wrestle with it as the maker too. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I really, I feel like... Uh, my experience of making and wrestling is is also I, I don't think it's completely hidden right so so that is yeah I think that's part of the experience I'm looking for for the viewer to to feel this object is not it wasn't it wasn't um, manufactured it didn't pop out mm -hmm. of a mold it's it's kind of um, organic so it does reflect you I think an object can be quite abstract and still have some um, feeling of reflection of you yourself, like I'm talking about this vulnerability of the material and vulnerability of yourself. I don't think it necessarily has to be like a, a realistic or abstracted figure for that to happen. Somehow for me, it can be a, quite an abstracted form um, and that can still be happening, especially if, if something's not uh, bringing us into a verbal conversation with the object. Like I can't say, oh, you know, that is a loaf of bread or that is a mug. My, my mind isn't in that part of itself that uses words, you know, so that experience can happen. Maybe all artwork when it, when it is really nourishing like that, then the materials do kind of slip away. And I feel like I've had that experience with each of your works. Um, can I just jump in and um, kind of going back to Jane's question of, yeah. of um, transformation. Um, I think it, uh, I just have it here. The moment when your work, when you understand it to have changed form and become something other than what it was. Um, also, I'll be quick. I'll be quick so we can like keep more questions coming too. But I think for me personally, it's like it's a little bit different. Maybe in that um, because I'm using so much quotation and, and so much um, direct reference material, um, really kind of. Uh, just like stealing and kind of like pillaging these these images. Um, there, there's like I think of many layers of transformation that happens from the from the image kind of not being my own and not belonging to me to something that I then feel quite intimately like that it belongs to me. And and there's like a long process between those two ends of the spectrum. And the first in the, like the first transformation I think of is seems so simple, but just the idea that I'm working from JPEG images of, of my reference imagery rather than the, the reference painting itself. Like I'm not in a museum kind of like 
looking at. So there's this transformation that happens in a kind of digital space. And I like to play digitally for quite a long time with the forms that I'm kind of quoting and, and pulling from. Um, and then the, I think the, the, the kind of closer to the other end of the spectrum, when it's finally kind of becoming my own form, uh, I look for a kind of transformation um, that, I, that I think of in terms of uh, a kind of disassociating, like the shape has fully disassociated from its origins. Mm -hmm. It, I no longer think of it, um, I wasn't prepared to share my screen. But I, I, I can do that for you right now. Hold on. No, no, oh, I you've done it. Okay, I guess, perfect. I think okay. I just talk a little bit as yeah. we were talking. No problem. Um, so, you know, here's a cutout that was in the show. So the shape for me no longer um, is tied to its origin. In this case, like it was a kind of dress form that came from a painting by the Polish uh, painter Balthus. Um, it becomes something new through either a simple method of draping or just kind of a decontextualizing of its environment and surroundings that it originally kind of had um, through color, through combination, um, through, through shapes being rotated, copy pasted, paired with something other and unrelated, whether that's pattern or color or another shape of its own. Um, and so the moment that I stopped seeing the shape for what it used to be is mm. kind of maybe to answer Jane's question, I feel like that's the moment I've reached that kind of material transformation. Um, and I mean material as in like the, the subject matter material that I use. Um, there's physical material transformations that occur through the draping of the actual kind of sculptural material in, the, in this case, but yeah, I think I'm more interested in kind of the, the material transformation of, of that digital source material <laughs> and when it becomes um, my own, in a sense. And I mean, I also have another question about your, your draped paintings. Because mm -hmm. um, I've been so curious about the process behind them. So are they, do, are they first kind of like born as paintings and then you decide that, oh, I'm gonna cut into this one or are they actually made with the intention of it being a draped cutout? Mm -hmm. And how does that like, how does that process unfold? They originally, a couple of years ago when I started to try to cut into the canvas and drape it, they did come from my grad school paintings and man, it felt so good. <laughs> <laughs> take a pair of really sharp sewing scissors and like go into this enormous canvas. Um, so it started as a way, as like kind of a reusing, recycling, just total experiment um, and probably a little bit therapeutic as well. Um, but then uh, as I, yeah, as I started to become more intentional about the size and the shape and kind of the surfaces, surface qualities I was looking for, um, now I make, now I make these shapes as cutouts, like I stretch canvas on the wall, I gesso it, I, I kind of prepare it exactly the same way, but knowing that I'm gonna um, kind of collage these shapes onto the surface and start cutting cutting them out from, from around one another. Um, so it, kind of, it feels almost like sewing patterns or something, like I'm trying to like save as much space <laughs> as I can on this big stretched swath of canvas, you know? So the, they they look like paintings in in a, before I began cutting them out because I've kind of composed this large uh, these shapes kind of all together but but then yeah they become sliced sliced and spliced apart um, and yeah so anyway I'm continuing to kind of the methods change every time a little bit depending on what I have to recycle and what I what I don't so it's still evolving in terms of process. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and really, you know, Emmy, thinking about your work, these draped paintings is really referencing textile is really, you know, looking at these dress patterns and also, you know, as we're installing it and we're opening them up and opening up the works and then installing them, like trying to, you know, realizing that it is fabric canvas, you know, and the way it does drape and it curls and it, you know, really thinking about the medium and, and um, you know, we're trying to control this medium but it it does it has its own life and it changes in the room and 
So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, you know, the, the difference between your stretch paintings and these works that come off the wall and become, become uh, um, you know, referencing textile and even, even the wooden uh, armatures is kind of almost like a, you know, like a clothing rack, you know, has this feeling even the same height in our, you know, in our um, relationship to our body that a clothing rack would have. So yeah, it's an interesting um, process for sure. Um, did we want to, I know Yanni and Jane, you might have a couple other questions you'd like to ask. I have, we've kind of covered a lot of my kind of initial questions, but um, I know Jane, you have a few more in the list here if you wanted to, or, or Yanni, I think we have time for um, probably, you know, one more question for everyone to go around and then we can open it up to the room for audience questions. Yeah, I mean, I can go, Yanni, do you have a question? Oh, for, no, no, um, then maybe I'll ask this question about shape um, since that's something that sort of each of you have touched on um, in some capacity, but maybe to sort of dig into it a little bit more um, about how you're each, what your relationship is to kind of shape as a as something that that defines some aspect of each of your practices um when I was thinking about like how to approach um writing about this show I was reading um about this exhibition that aimed the painter Amy Selman had organized at MoMA a few years ago um it was interest on on shape like on the history of shape and she was thinking about how there hadn't been in a collection like MoMA, like a real accounting of how artists use shape. Like you could have exhibitions or sort of histories written about um, many different kinds of painting methodologies, but one hadn't really been written about shape. So I was thinking about this um, quite a bit. And in her writing for the project, they also produced a zine for this exhibition. Um, she wrote about how, um, sort of we all walk around with two shapes there's the shape that is our body which we can't escape from and the shape that is our shadow which we can't get rid of and so she writes that your shadow is your own personal shape this kind of like silent companion this flat echo and there was something about that relationship between shape and the body that felt very resonant with each of your works for some reason although I couldn't quite figure out a way to um, distinguish that so I guess I just wanted to sort of put this question back to each of you around how you think about shape in your work, how you work with it. Um, Rasna, like I know in your work, you work a lot with line, but I think that this kind of defining of shape is very much also connected with um, a process of using line and outline and color blocking. Um, yeah, so maybe if each of you want to um, respond in, in some way around your relationship with shape in your work, um, I'd be curious to hear. Maybe uh, uh, I can jump in first. Um, Jane, I really, I was so excited that for the, the essay that you wrote that you kind of honed in on this um, seemingly kind of simple idea of shape. But of course, mm -hmm. as, as we read your writing and as we, you know, um, as, you know, Amy Silman so eloquently also describes like shape is very complex and it's really difficult <laughs> to put words <laughs> to, even kind of like what what a shape is and, and why, mm -hmm. why it hasn't been discussed in the same way that line or um, other kind of formal elements of, of painting and drawing. Um, but yeah, so like shape is something I think about actually from the get go. And um, I never really paid too much attention to that until recently, but shape is where the a painting begins for me. I don't necessarily think in terms of color, um, uh, composition it's just I, I I find a shape and that kind of stays with me in a desktop folder and, and I, I, I find I'm a real kind of collector of, of shape and back in grad school that took the form of still lives and collecting objects and collecting these these physical shapes now it's more kind of the digital shape um, but it's always the starting point for me um, and Amy Silman, there's there's a really great interview um, with a curator, um, Jenny Lomax, I think. Mm -hmm. And Amy Silman's, um, she's talking a lot about how children engage with shape and how uh, they're one of kind of the first things in life that you kind of, as a child, organize and respond to very, um, without kind of bias, without, uh, kind of information about what those shapes are, but, um, and how the moment kind of 
the moment you're no longer a child, a shape suddenly inevitably holds symbol and language and association with figure, figure ground. Um, and you can't really get back to that place of just that like freedom of organizing shapes like a child would. Um, so, anyway, so I've been thinking about that quote and and how in my paintings, I'm I'm trying to like get to that place of, of moving beyond symbol and moving beyond um, figure and ground. And although, I mean, I'm really interested in figure ground stuff, but for the most part, maybe in the cutouts, trying to move beyond uh, that idea of a shape attached to, to, to an association and, and kind of how do you get into that child mindset of, um, yeah, of, of, mm -hmm. of shape on its own without that language attached. Um, or yeah. that meaning attached, because you're right, like when a shape becomes a symbol, it's something else entirely. Mm -hmm. But to mm -hmm. try to see and work and manipulate shapes outside of a kind of symbolic realm seems mm -hmm. particularly challenging. There's, um, I'm, I'm doing some research on, for an essay on like hard edge abstraction right now. So I'm looking at a lot of like shape painters, which again, mm -hmm. it's funny how much shape is suddenly in my mind these days. I, I'm really thankful for it. <laughs> Good. Um, but uh, there's this fantastic painter named Prunella Cloth, who um, she talks about harvesting shapes from her environment and replanting them in her paintings. And I was mm -hmm. thinking about those words a lot. and. I think in my work, what I'm trying to, or what I experience at least is when two shapes are brought together or maybe like planted, there, there is a, this kind of new thing that grows. Like they've, they've been harvested, replanted in my work. And, I, and I'm looking for that like growth of, of something new, like a new fruit to, you know, to form. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of that opening of, of, of a new possibility by simply combining two disparate shapes. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and just to kind of jump off of that um shape for me I think uh, um, artist uh Rachel White Reed really kind of had mm -hmm. an influence on how I look at the spaces around me and the shapes that make them up and uh I would often kind of you know I, I was always really into photography and was taking photographs, but never really did much with them. But what I did used to do sometimes to kind of really start to analyze what my surroundings are made up of, I would take a photograph and lay some tracing paper on top of it and not only wow. outline and highlight the positive shapes, but also the negative shapes or the shapes of the things in between or the things that are not actually the focus of what we're looking at, but sometimes are more hidden and you kind of have to dig them out. And then all of a sudden, sometimes the negative shapes and spaces are a lot more interesting than what the actual objects that we are surrounded by are, um, or more the positive spaces. And so mm -hmm. what I would do is then digitally, I would start to manipulate these shapes that I've kind of pulled from these photographs and pulled from these kind of outline drawings that I would create. And then I would play with scale and um, you know, uh, in composition and repeating uh, shapes to create these patterns that then I, you know, with my shifting panels are then disrupted once again, but then also taking the time to look at my previous work and my previous paintings, because I do believe there's a lot of information in everything that we make, but I feel like so often we make something and then we kind of set it aside and move on to the next thing. Whereas, you know, I really like to take my time to almost peel back the layers of the paintings that I've already created. And, you know, much like that practice of outlining certain shapes and forms from photographs that I've taken, I would do the same for my paintings. And I would start to outline some of the shapes and forms within my paintings and then kind of extract them from one and use that as a starting point or a kind of launching point for the next work. And I think through that process or that kind of act of observation and slowing things down, you really start to learn a lot about, um, I don't know, who you are as an artist, but also as a person. And I think this is something that I've also encouraged my students to do a lot over the last two years when we're all kind of working from remote places and to really look at what you surround yourself with, because there's kind of clues and hints 
um, I think these objects and the spaces in between and the spaces that they create really reveal a lot about ourselves. And I think of a painting in a very similar way, like it is quite literally a reflection of an aspect of yourself in a lot of ways. Mm. And so I really like to take that time and much of my shapes and lines and forms come from either my direct surroundings um, or you know, analyzing a previous work of mine and bringing that into the next piece. Very cool. I relate to the negative uh, space, your love of negative space. I have a love <laughs> of negative space too. Um, for, for me, um, I think the history of what I've done uh, in the past also influences the shapes that I'm creating. Um, I did calligraphy for many years and studied Roman lettering and all, all of that. Um, and so I think the calligraphic uh, forms are, are somewhere in the shapes of my work, somewhere in the background, they're percolating around in there. <laughs> and uh, I think also, um, I spent about five years um, drawing and painting stills from an early film, um, Loey Fuller's Dance Performed by an Unknown Dancer. It's a 52 second film from the late 1800s um, by the Lumiere brothers. So it's available on YouTube. I took stills from that and drew and painted them for about five years. So it's a film you've, most of you have probably seen of a, a woman dancing. She's waving fabric around and forming these shapes that I find to be very, mm. um, they're feminine. To me, they're feminine from the female perspective rather than from the male perspective. And it, it was a dance that she had created and the Lumiere brothers asked if, if they could film it. And so I think, although I'm not looking at those uh, stills anymore, they're, they're also in me and they're coming out through my fingers somehow when I'm forming these, these mm. shapes of these, uh, these sculptures. And um, I also taught form and composition for many years. And uh, so all those formal kind of composition rules are not on the top of my mind at all. They're, they're gone somewhere, but they're still there. So I'm breaking the rules a little bit. And I find myself like super engaged with uh, the sculpture because it's a composition 360 times over. You turn it and it's a new yeah. composition every time and new shape. Um, so it's like, I don't know if I can ever uh, stop making these because they're, they're so engaging in that, in that way alone, never mind everything else. Um, yeah. I, I just want to, I really love Andrea, how you just your reference to calligraphy and I suddenly am like starting to see especially the sculpture behind you you know I'm kind of looking right at that of these becoming kind of an, an alphabet um suddenly I see like a kind of calligraphic gesture in each of them a kind of you know uh -huh. chunky and like disfigured but there's there's and like you say like they're never going to end and it's kind of this like unending alphabet you're inventing and to go back to Amy Silman actually and how much she talks about shape she she uses a uh, term um, dysfunctional hieroglyphics mm. as these kind of shapes that like they want to be symbolic and they want to kind of have a language but they're they're dysfunctional in some way they they kind of they can't get that far <laughs> um, so it's like your your pieces maybe are these like letters that don't have a sound yet or you know like we can't quite place um, but yeah, I like the I like the idea of the the calligraphic gesture. Yeah, um, that's that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You said it. <laughs> Did I say that? I don't know if I said it quite like that. I mean, that's that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got about fifteen minutes or so left. Uh, Yanni, was there any other final questions you had before we um, open it up? I'll just tack on like a little thing that I was thinking of when you're all talking about shape and uh, you know because I spend so much time thinking about reception um, something about shape is that it's one of the first sort of entryways that we have towards empathy um, 
And that is through something that we all have, although some of us are more heightened. Um, it's called mirror touch synesthesia, um, where we actually uh, come to identify with the shape of the thing that we see. Um, so people who have really heightened sense of mirror touch synesthesia actually feel like pulled beyond themselves through the shape of other things. Um, you know, like uh, finding like a line to be quite anxiety inducing for whatever, for a particular reason, because of insights of physical pull in their own bodies. So that was just something that I was thinking mm -hmm. to hear you all talk about shape is, um, you know, for us, you know, maybe like Jane and Kate and I, like when we look at works like yours, which are so form dependent or shape dependent, um, one of the things that I was thinking is how does this shape make me feel? Um, and it's one of the ways in which I would like interact with your work as uh, kind of like another body. Mm -hmm. That's making me, maybe this is kind of a tangent for another time, but making me think about how infants identify their mothers mainly through the shape of a hairline before mm -hmm. they have clear enough vision to see any mm -hmm. other facial features. It's it's kind of the dominant shape of light and dark of, of the hairline. And um, anyway, so just like how kind of fundamental like that identification and, and, and emotional response maybe to shape is. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, making me think. Yeah, a tangent there. <laughs> that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Yanni. That's like wow. I wrote that down. I'm gonna look into that. That's really an interesting um, comment for sure. Um, okay. Well, I guess we have some a few minutes left. We could open it up to the audience. So if you have a question, you can either type it into the chat and we can read it aloud, or you could uh, do the raise hand function. If you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, there's the reactions button there and you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and say hi and uh, ask your question. So we'll just give people a second just to uh, ruminate because I know it can be hard to, <laughs> to um, be put on the spot like that. Is anyone feeling bold this afternoon? <laughs> oh, someone raised their hand. Tyler Durbano, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi there, everyone. I won't turn on my video because my apartment is quite messy, but I have <laughs> a question that um, sort of picks up where you, Kate, and Jane um, brought in this idea of you know, knowing how much in each of the artist's works, how much to let the image recede and how much to let it come forward. And that, um, I think something that we're all sort of, uh, or what I'm listening to is that we're all dancing around this idea of intuition. And I was wondering how much intuition plays in, in each of your works. Um, <clears throat> for Emmy in particular, you, you talked about like collecting shapes and I can almost imagine something tingling inside when you see a, a particularly good shape and knowing when to collect that. So I was wondering how intuition factored into everything. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't often think about intuition because it's really difficult to think of. Like it, it's a kind of a slippery slope of trying. Um, yeah, but, but I appreciate the question. It's kind of a challenging one. Um, I, I, definitely have that kind of immediate response or kind of aha moment if I like find something, but then I actually have a lot of difficulty and doubt. And I really, like I, I have to spend so much time with these forms that I'm playing around with and rotating and cropping and all that um, before I actually feel that it's usable. It's never, I feel like I don't often make the right choice from the get-go. I actually have to like go, go back. Like my, maybe my intuition actually isn't. So it kind of like puts me in a pickle a lot of the time. I have to kind of like go back and actually think, well, maybe that dominant shape isn't the one I should be looking at. Kind of like what Rasna said, maybe I should be looking at kind of some of these negative shapes around it. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it's so intuitive as kind of 
there's a lot of second guessing and kind of just just pulling these images apart until I finally get to a place that I definitely wouldn't have gotten to in that first aha moment. Um, so maybe that's like, maybe I'm saying I'm not that intuitive <laughs> with my choices. And, and uh, yeah, I find it really, I, I, I find I make a lot of wrong decisions first. And then the choice of shape actually ends up in the cutouts. I have to totally flip my mind around to think about kind of a function of like how this shape drapes, does it have a floppy bit that's gonna like kind of interrupt this surface and suddenly the shapes have to have these different connection points and stuff that otherwise wouldn't be an issue. So, so it doesn't necessarily feel intuitive for me, to be honest. <laughs> for me, when I think about um, the question of intuition, um, I mean, that certainly comes into it, um, especially when deciding, like, when the work is finished. Um, like when we answered uh, Jane's question about that. Um, but I don't know why the idea of intuition makes me think more about curiosity, which is something that I definitely consciously follow uh, in my practice. I'm, um, it comes more without thinking now, but I, I used to consciously make myself follow my curiosity, um, like what would happen if I do this type of thing? Um, what if I tried this? Would it be crazy to turn this upside down? What if I break it in half and put it back together again? Um, and just letting myself follow those things. So in that way, it's kind of an intuitive process for, through maybe the idea of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to go off of that and in, in terms of like curiosity and just kind of going for it, I definitely think of a more kind of like experimental approach and um, and you know there I, I think there are certain things that um, like color palette, I feel like that is something that is such a huge part of my life and I have a certain comfort with using colors. So I feel like maybe in terms of things that kind of, inspire me automatically or um, that I feel, you know, I have so much experience in. I feel like I'm a lot more free with uh, color palette, but in terms of composition, I am also like Emmy where I feel like everything is very much planned and thought out, especially if I'm working on the kind of oversized scale works, it would be really kind of scary to just approach that without much of a plan so I like to have something to work from but throughout the process that changes so much and um, and I also think that that's where the working on multiple surfaces kind of um, for me almost maybe acts as a bit of a, a safety net where you know if I'm working on a composition and I feel like the painting has got to a point where you know adding more materials isn't going to really fix anything or I can kind of remove a panel or flip a panel and all of a sudden everything opens up again and I'm able to kind of dig in and look at the painting with a fresh set of eyes. And um, I, I'm also a big fan of Mark Bradford's work and he kind of spoke to something similar, but you know, in, in his works that he creates these kind of paper pulp paintings and he embeds these really thick pieces of rope in between and uh, you know he says that you know once he feels like the painting is dead or that he can't kind of revive it he will actually pull one of these ropes and tear through all the layers and then all of a sudden the painting opens up again and so maybe I feel like that act of that spontaneity that comes with flipping panels or this experimental approach to kind of mixing weird things sometimes into the paint that comes more I guess intuitively than the actual planning of the composition is very much um, a long process and um, can sometimes be scary. So I feel like I need to have some sort of plan to go off of. Hmm. Thanks, Resna. Um, we have one question in the chat here. It says, thank you everyone for this amazing body of work. What role do chance and the impossibility to materialize inner thought and memory play in your creative process? And this question goes for everyone for all three artists. It's in the chat if you wanna just take a glance at it before tackling that question. 
I'm interested in that phrasing, the impossibility to materialize inner thought and memory. Um, and I'm like kind of trying to wrap my head around what what it means. Um, but it's kind of reminding me of a couple of questions Yanni and Jane and Kate had kind of brought up earlier of how like our own kind of body, I forget the exact question, but like how our like body and self, self is kind of like in the work when it's not overtly figurative or kind of even representational. So I'm, I don't know this question that that idea of the impossibility of kind of materializing that 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 your your memory your 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 being um, into a work uh, is kind of making me think of that um, how we're all kind of representing a feeling of the body in in very different ways and of course that is personal like we're representing our, our identities in in, in the, obscure ways. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to answer this question exactly, but for me, I, my work is, has always felt a little bit distanced from actually being personal because I'm pulling from like a different author's image it, you know, like, so, so I've, I've often kind of questioned where am I in this work? Um, and, and that has been a challenge that has fueled me, but, but it has been challenging. And so I think a lot about, um, how yes, my self may be removed from some of the content, um, yet my body is very much involved in the in the building of these. And it's I was in the studio the other day working on these cutouts, and I was thinking over and over the word bodybuilding, probably because I was like really sweating and like kind of physically exerting myself, but also this idea of like building a new body from these shapes that I'm pulling from often figurative paintings, and how these like. I'm kind of like building, they're often a one-to-one -one, um, size of my own body. That's kind of how I work. And so I'm kind of building my own body in a, in a way from these scraps and parts that initially did not belong to me whatsoever. So maybe that's a bit of an odd answer to your question. If it sort of makes me think of. So. For me, um... I guess chance plays a big role uh, because I don't control the cardboard completely. It, it has a say, so there's a chance. I never know what the shape is really going to be. Uh, um, it's endlessly surprising. Uh, so there's that. And I think um, memory, what, the, what that brings up uh, for me is, is thinking about um, the role that motion has in my work, although there's still sculptures. Um, I'm attempting to imbue some motion into them, whether it be like they're, they look like they're just about to start to move or maybe they just finished moving. There's something, a motion in them. Um, and so there's some idea of the, my memory of, of movements or of gestures. Um, for many years, I drew and painted the figure like realistically. Uh, so there's that memory of actually doing that and feeling those gestures and in visual work uh, and my own memories of moving um, or even in the moment if I'm dancing around the studio when no one's looking, it's, it's best that way. Uh, and, um, those motions can, I, I can try to put them, those memories of those motions into, into the sculptures. Yeah. Um. Sorry, I'm still trying to think of, I mean, in, in terms of chance, um, kind of like I mentioned earlier, there there can be a small sense of, you know, chance or things happening in the studio that are not planned, but, um, you know, my sketches and, and I do very much have a very detailed plan, but in terms of uh, certain materials that I use, for example, when I'm mixing in, let's say, different types of sawdust into my paint or sand or other materials, you don't exactly always know how that's going to dry or how it's going to work. Or, you know, when I'm trying to mix a color, a very specific color, which I don't always like doing because I find color mixing really difficult. So I feel like there is a huge element of chance in that. Like it might look like the color that I want it to look like, or it might just completely look like this disgusting weird color and sometimes I just go with it and I kind of to a certain degree I just give up and I'm like okay maybe I'm just never going to mix that color so I should just change the color um so that definitely happens um and 
I guess like this impossibility to materialize inner thought, which for me is like trying to make sense of what's going on in your mind and actually have that, um, you know, have your ideas match up with what you're making in the studio. And I feel like in both ways, like that kind of the earlier example that I gave of color mixing or certain materials, you're not knowing what the material is going to do. And this kind of desire to create something that you've made up in your head. And once you create it, it's maybe not exactly what you had initially imagined or, and, and I feel like both things kind of create a sense of frustration, but not in a bad way, in a way that's actually kind of motivating for me. And so it makes me eager to create the next painting. So I'm like, okay, well, I've learned X, Y, Z from this painting. I'm gonna bring it to the next one. And maybe that one will be closer to what I had initially imagined. And I feel like it's a kind of ongoing cycle. So I guess the it, it kind of creates, to try to answer the question, creates this, uh, good frustration which then motivates me to keep on making and constantly keeps painting exciting and you know um some things are just maybe always going to be unknown and always going to be in an experimental phase and maybe that's okay i feel similarly about writing <laughs> sometimes <laughs> thank you so much um uh, Meredith, we have a couple minutes left. Are we going to be booted off or is, is there a chance to, I don't know, I, I'm conscious of everyone's time because there is another question here and I don't want to, you know, we're, we're at almost at 1.30. Do you know, Meredith, if we can stay for another minute or two? Um, I don't think we'll be booted off because okay. we, have, we have a proper Zoom account. Okay, um, perfect. So yeah, I think it okay. should be fine. Uh, is everyone uh, feeling okay with one more question? I know Jane, you have to catch a plane soon, but <laughs> um, I might jump off. But yeah. yeah, let me just say thanks everyone for um, your work, and I hope that this fruitful conversation um, continues. And yeah, thanks. It was a pleasure to be a part of this panel. Thanks, thanks so much, Jane. Training. Thank you, <laughs> Kate. I actually might also have to yeah. step out very. No soon. problem. Okay. Uh, so just really quick last question. Um, this is our final one. Uh, it's actually quite a nice question. Um, I wondered if having this show with one another has encouraged you to try new things in the studio. If your fellow artists work has motivated you to integrate something new you've been inspired by. That's a good question. <laughs> it's a nice last question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can jump in. I have totally been inspired by both Emmy and Andrea's work. Um, I know Andrea, you and I have had so many conversations about the stop motion uh, video that you created, which um, for me, that's an entirely, you know, new, I, I've never tried anything uh, when it comes to kind of animation or creating videos. And, and so that was definitely something that got me thinking and um, maybe made me excited to try it one day. Um, and also with Emmy, the versatility, like the, the, the ways that you're approaching painting with the cutouts and then also like the kind of a more traditional painting on the wall, but the, the cutouts, especially like the line between painting and sculpture. And I feel like that's also something that I've been thinking a lot about in the studio. And, um, and then also seeing the draped piece over the chair and just how differently the material like canvas can be read uh, just by like something that seems like a single gesture of cutting cutting out and draping versus cutting out and stretching. Um, so, I mean, both both of your creative processes have definitely made me think about a lot of things in the studio more recently, specifically kind of the line between painting and sculpture. Um, so yeah, I really appreciated having the opportunity to show with both of you. Thanks, Resna. <laughs> There's like a loud monster truck or something outside my window, so I hope you can still hear me. Um, uh, one thing that I was really inspired by and have been thinking about, um, having had so many discussions now um, with each other, is where we where we pull from. Like, where does this work come from? And specifically, shape, image, form, all these things we've been talking about. Um, but I think we each have very distinct. Kind of roots that we that we take to kind of find our content like you know for for a shape to emerge and um and i'm so like i'm incredibly inspired by the ways like andrea you speak to this kind of embodied 
you know, intuitive kind of feeling with your sculptures, but all like I, I love the references that you're pulling from also of the dress image, um, calligraphy, you know. Um, and then Rasna thinking of that part, like the very kind of personal kind of family history, words, colors, textures that come in. Anyway, so I, I, I take a lot of inspiration. I don't know how, it, I know that it informs my own work by being inspired by you. I don't know, I don't know if I'm seeing it uh, right now, but I know that it will come of kind of thinking of all the different avenues we take um, uh, uh, to pull in these references. Cause I think each of us do that very specifically. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I also feel uh, very inspired by both of your practices. I feel like um, being in conversation with your works has been such an honor and a privilege and a fantastic experience. And I feel like it enriches my practice. Like you say, I mean, in ways I don't, I couldn't identify specifically, but I, I feel personally very enriched by uh, working with you both and, and being in conversation with your work, having my work in conversation with your works in the gallery and, and working with you both. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to thank all the artists too, just how collaborative the whole process has been. And I really enjoyed our bi-weekly meetings leading up to it and planning towards the show and the writing. And it was really, uh, and it was really amazing experience for me, a, a really wonderful challenge. And I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, and thank you, Meredith, for the opportunity to curate this project. And thank you, Yanni, so much for your thoughtful writing for the zine. It really enriched the whole project and Jane as well. So and um, thanks to everyone for coming out today. It was really wonderful to see so many faces. And and um, yeah, I don't know if uh, Meredith, you have any uh, last words you'd like to share before we sign off? Yeah, just a thanks to everyone as well. Um, to Kate for doing a beautiful job curating and moderating this talk and uh, Jane and Yanni for their writing. Um, and of course, Emmy, Andrea, Rasna, all of, all of your work throughout this whole mm -hmm. process has been really, really um, wonderful and very appreciated by our organization. And I know that the, the response from the public has been incredible. So thank you all who chose to come out and uh, spend some time on your Sunday thinking about some of these, um, these really generative ideas that have, uh, have come up today. So I, I did share a link to, um, to our website where the talk, this talk will be posted next week. Um, and there's also uh, access to the zine that way. So if you haven't had a chance to see it in person or you wanted to revisit Jane and Yanni's talks or some of the poetry that the artists wrote or some of just their kind of sketchbook process imagery in there, um, please uh, do so. And um, yeah, and thank you so much. Um, it's, it's been such a pleasure. Such a pleasure, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah thank you everyone. It's great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to press end and hopefully the recording works on my end. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Wait, Meredith. Oh, she's gone. <laughs>